I see a police car, uh, like uh, kind of just like pulling the brake and looking at me like this. And in my head, I just hear Hans Zimmer, you know, <laughs> I'm like, yes, uh, this is going to be so much fun. Men are lost, men don't have purpose, men are killing themselves in droves. I'm quite surprised that I'm not dead. Tate is uh, analytically correct. Huh? He, he, he did his, his, when he combed society to see what's going on with men, he understood it perfectly. Welcome to a special edition of The Interviewer. I've been wanting to interview this episode's guest for a very long time. Fellow podcaster John Malia has just hit a century with his podcast of the same name. John's frank and in-depth interviews with Maltese personalities in our native Maltese language has become a huge hit across the Maltese islands. John's style has frequently been paralleled with Joe Rogan, and John's bombastic personality is also present across pretty much all social media. But when researching John for today, a single statement he made in 2020 really struck me. John, you said that you get high off the idea of being helpful. So I started looking into you and this resonates beyond the podcast, beyond Kashaturi with Love in Malta, beyond being a rap artist, beyond TikTok and Instagram. This resonates with Man Up Malta. This resonates with teaching prisoners to rap. This also reflects working with migrants and perhaps also echoes your mum's work as a social worker. So I have always been really, really curious. We know you as John Malia for everything that you've done, but I really want to get to know you and what drives you. So first of all, thank you so much. And I'm so uh, glad that we can finally do this. Uh, thank you so much for the really uh, generous intro, I would say. Um, and also uh, apologies for my diary being just such uh, cluster okay. beep, uh, that is, but, but we made it, we made it. We we're, made we're, it, we're, we're here. we made it here. Well, look, I want to go through a journey with you over the next however long this is going to take. And I sure. want to start off because, as I said, that statement that you made that about getting high on being helpful really kind of drove me to look at more and more of you that I could find. And, and I wanted to come and ask you, I wanted to say to you, look, you had a very interesting beginning to your life. You had a challenging beginning to your life. You're from Hamroon. You had a tough upbringing. And I wanted to kind of find out what in your early formative years shaped this, this John Malia person who we see in the media, but also obviously has this passion for helping people and, and contributing in other ways. So what was your formative years like? So, so let, let me clear that up and, and, and kind of start to articulate bits and pieces of, of everything you asked. So first of all, I wouldn't say I had a particularly tough upbringing. I think the person that had the toughest upbringing was definitely my mother, right? So my, my mother um, raised in Hamroon, uh, where she was, well, abjectly poor, right? My mother was, uh, at, at a very, very young age, um, forced into becoming the, the leader of a, of a household whereby, you know, the, the father was unfortunately an alcoholic. Um, wow. The, the, the mother, you know, like at, at the time, they didn't have self-help books. They didn't have, I don't know, Jordan Peterson to explain to you how that. So, so my mother was really in a, in a very um, tough, tough, tough sport. So, so it, for example, it wasn't until she was married that my mother ever slept on a bed, right? Uh, it was a, like it, routinely she would be made to go to the grocery store and kind of hustle with the, with the grocer in order for him to give them bread and milk and no, oh, we'll pay you at the end of the month, don't worry about it. So, so my mother is, she has, she's, she's freak, my mother is born on the 7th of June. Sette Junior. Of course. And the fight in my mother is, my mother is just a beast, right? A beast, but the people that, that, that whose lives my mother touched will tell you that she's also a saint. So my mother is kind of, 
she's, as you can see, she's quite like a, someone I really look up to. Yeah, because of she's a beautiful balance of someone that can deliver a proper left hook, and she has to my jaw numerous times, not numerous times, but one time I was shook. <laughs> I was shook. And, and, but also at the same time, um, very altruistic, very loving, has the, the ability to see potential in people and has the ability to, to present herself as a mirror to that person to see the potential within themselves. And she's changed so many people's lives across the board. I'm sure there's going to be people that are watching this and going to, you're going to get comments and say, yes, well, Francis Malia is a hero. So what happened was that, that uh, my mom then, kind of, then, then left the home, got married and everything else. And my mom and my dad were... Um, trying to start a business, right? Which wasn't easy at the time. My, my father was trying to break into um, the, the haberdashery business, okay. which doesn't sound uh, excessively exciting, thrilling or, thrilling or dramatic, but at the time, the haberdashery business in Malta, uh, there was a, it was a cartel, right? There was four or five, four or five shops that sold haberdashery and you couldn't, you couldn't wedge your way into it why my father decided that he's going to go into this business, I, I, I'm not sure. But he, uh, he had somehow gotten his hands on a shop in Valletta and he, he was in like lots and lots of debt um, and he'd have sleepless nights and he was on all sorts of um, volume was popular at the time. I think it's oh my word. Prozac. Right, right. But, so it was very tough for him, very, very tough. Um, and... And Wait, give me a, a sort of an era because you mentioned Valium. This is, this and, and is uh, 80s. Which, uh, so Valium was very popular. Sorry? It was very popular. Yes, 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 yes. Um, it was, and it was also accepted, you know, so she yeah. accepted. So anyway, uh, my dad uh, is trying to get into this, this, this kind of retail market of haberdashery. The other uh, cl uh, shops are writing to the supplier saying, listen, if you supply Malia, then we will no longer buy from you. So my, my father essentially had a shop that he was trying to uh, stock. Um, rent that he's paying, or not rent, sorry, rather a loan that he's paying. It was a very complicated financial situation. So him having my mother by his side, what they decided was, this was obviously pre-internet, they went to all the um, Southeast Asia ambassadorships and consulates that they could find all across Malta. Um, they got addresses of, I think it was somewhere in the region of a thousand possible suppliers, and they wrote to all of them. And they said, listen, can you kindly, can you kindly, can you kindly? Sure enough, a few of them wrote back, you know, people from, I think it was, I, be, I might be wrong, but I believe it was ta Taiwan. I believe it was Taiwan. Okay. And, they, and, and eventually, like, these Taiwanese people gave my dad a price that was like a tenth of the, the price that the other uh, supplier from England was offering. So my dad was like, okay, we're going to roll the dice. Wife, we're going to send this person, like, our last thousand Moltaliri to send us, you know, buttons and zips and whatever, um, brooches. And uh, we're going to see, like, how, how, the, how the chips fall, you know. Um, sure enough, the supplier was legitimate, sent my dad the, the consignment, and my dad then basically could undercut almost everyone else. Because now, since they were paying 10 times the price for a button, and let's say they were paying 10 cents for a button, my dad was paying one cent. My dad could sell that button for five cents. They could never sell that for five cents, right? Um, and eventually had a, a fairly uh, lucrative retail business. Um, was there so, any feedback from, from the monopoly? From um, the you know what? I never asked about that part of the story. I, I can't say, I can't, I, I'm assuming there was some kind of frigidity or some kind of, there was never any like repercussion in, the, in terms okay. of right. violence or anything that I don't think. I don't mm. think. He might be watching and going, what are you nuts? Of course there was. Um, <laughs> but, um, so while they were doing all of this, um, it, it was the time of, there was as well, more there was some uh, political strife going on. There was social mobility going on, you know, with my parents. So uh, my parents, I think, look, my parents are fantastic people, fantastic people. Uh, they really did uh, their utmost. They're very moral human beings. But like all parents, I'm a parent. Um, and I, I talk like this now, right? Because now I have kids. And I know as much as I try how easy it is to simply not pay enough attention at the right time for something that 
may ha perhaps you could have assuaged that you didn't only because you were too tired, for example, right? Um, so, so the that gave me kind of access to. Uh, I used to be spending a lot of time with my grandma, who was from Hamu, who was coming from the same, well, it's what we call a Kareya, which, like which is the equivalent of Islam. So I spent a lot of time there um, with a lot of kids from the area that were, you know, um, very excitable and mischievous and <laughs> taught you how to uh, how to get into all, all sorts. And, and you mean naughty kids? Naughty kids, you know. And, and, and now I look at my son. My son's like 15. Uh, and I remember, like, by the time I was 10, I was already kind of nicking CDs from Exotic, you know, um, <laughs> routinely, routinely. And my son ever thought about You're the awful dodger, aren't you? I mean, you could just play that role. <laughs> I, 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 don't know, I don't know if it was very much... I, I think it was more the thrill of uh, being able to pull certain things off. And, uh, for example, on my way here, I was, I was recollecting um, because... I had a friend called Scott Kerr, and I, I remembered because I know you, you know obviously her surname's Kerr. I don't know if you do you know this kid Scott Kerr. I don't know, no, no. Anyway, so me, me um, the, oh maybe I shouldn't tell this story. No, wait, you I, absolutely I, I, should I, tell the story. I, I'll tell it from my from my side. But when I was fourteen, uh, we decided um, we decided that we're going to rent out Tattingers. At fourteen, you're not allowed in Tattingers. I'm going to rent out Tattingers at fourteen. So anyway, I called the guy up. Persuade him, uh, <laughs> a guy called Dominic, I think, persuaded him, uh, senior, to that we, we, we were going to rent out Tattingers on this particular date, and we we're going to uh, throw a hip hop party. I come from from the hip hop community, and but I was a nobody at, at that time. So I was 14 years old. No one knew who I was, whatever. So anyway, we um, we the guy agrees. I think we left some sort of deposit. Um, we start, uh, we print posters. I have a big fascination for poster printing, by the way, uh, just the machinery of it. And um, we need, I remember we needed 100 lira, 100 lira for the posters and something for the deposit. And I had persuaded Southern Fried Chicken at the time uh, to give me 100 lira. Hang on, you're 14. I'm 14, I'm 14. <laughs> and so what we do is we kind of, Go to uh, went to Bonnici Press in Xira, who used to be run by by my friend's dad. He prints he prints the posters for us. I take them away in a in a, in a big in a big bag. Uh, go off to the iron mongery, buy a bucket of uh, wood glue, mix it with um, with mix it with water and a big and a big brush. And I'm just walking around Sui, um, just uh, sticking posters on any literally any wall. That that I that we come across. If it's a blank wall, it's getting done. So we're doing the entire Sweetie playground, um, and then all of a sudden, I think the mayor of Sweetie came out of his own house and he said, "What are you doing?" I said, "Don't worry, I have a permit." I said, "From you?" I said, "Local council." He says, "I'm the mayor." I'm like, oh no, I mean the police. He said, "Yeah, the police wait here." I'm like, okay, sure, go inside. Like at the time, there was no mobile phone, so the guy went inside to call the police. Obviously, I wasn't gonna wait around. So he said, yeah, yeah, no, no, you can go and check. Go check. He, he goes inside. I bolt. Um, I crossed it. You know where the sweet playground where there's the tennis courts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I go across the road uh, where there's that petrol station. I cross the petrol station. As I'm crossing the petrol, uh, the, the street to the other side where Luxol is, I see a police car, um, like uh, kind of just like pulling the brake and looking at me like this. And in my head, <laughs> I just hear Hans Zimmer, you know. <laughs> I'm like, yes, uh, this is going to be so much fun. So anyway, I, 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 uh, I drop the bucket of paint. I hold on to the posters and then just like beeline into Luxol. I jump over. At the time, Luxol was, was far more forlorn than it is today, right? So I'm jumping over the walls. I make it to the Verdala School. I don't know if you know where Verdala School Yay. is back there. This guy is still chasing me. <laughs> Weirdly, he's calling me a pufta. I'm like, oh my oh. word. Pufta, auntie, pufta. I'm like, bro, no, I, I, I don't know what you're talking I like girls. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so cute. Like he, and I was making him mad because I was, I, this was my answer, you know, to this guy rather than, okay, okay. And then he pulled out a gun and he said he's going to shoot me. And uh, yeah, that's when I stopped. I said, all right, this, and okay, this goes serious the now. story there. What happened next? What happened next was that the party was obviously sold out because what happened was that uh, the people had, saw the, had seen the chase 
right, of this crazy 14-year-old boy and his posters and the cop and this fucking, <laughs> sorry, this, this cop uh, uh, chasing me down. Um, meanwhile, they take me to the police station. They call my father. My father turns up. My father turns up <laughs> in shorts. Have you ever seen <laughs> these Sigmund Freud T-shirts? You know the one, you know the one, what's on a man's mind where the mustache is the pussy? <laughs> that one. And my father walks into the police station like that. And, um, and obviously the, 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 the policeman is like, you know, tell your son this is terrible. He's like, what are we doing? And it's like, he was sticking posters on walls. It's like, ah, yeah, no, nah, no. Nah. Uh, anyway, my dad was just happy I was in Enterprise, right? He, he, could, he could not give less of a crap about what this policeman was saying. Um, but what happened was, word got around, you know, John was, uh, yeah, John was being chased by the police. And obviously, this is very much in line with the hip-hop brand, right? Like, yeah, for, yeah, for yeah, hip-hop, for sure. this, is, this is perfect. You are living the brand. This was perfect. It was being chased by police to try to <laughs> get posters for a hip-hop party, you know? At the time, Shaim was a big, a big artist, and his big song was F the Police. So, so anyway, it's, it's wound up uh, being uh, an incredible night at Tattinger's. Um, where I was uh, 14 years old, standing outside, can't technically go in, and then they let me in for like 30 minutes of the event. Um, but yeah, that, that was my... That's I think, insane. That was my first kind of uh, interface with them. But they worked out that you were 14. Yes, no, me, obviously when I went to the police station and they're telling me oh, who's, this, who's organizing oh, the party. Lord. I'm like, I'm organizing the party. Like, no, you're not. Who put you up to this? I'm like, no, no one put me up to this. I'm organizing this party. They're like, no, who's the promoter? I said, I'm the promoter. It's me. I'm the promoter. <laughs> they can't be your 40. I'm like, bro, you keep saying that. And I told you that. But the two things aren't mutually exclusive. <laughs> you think you're funny? I'm like, no. no. <laughs> a bit. Sometimes. Oh, Lord above. See, the promoter's in the police for you. There you go. Yes. You have yes. a lot to thank them for. Yes, uh, I have a great relationship with many with many um, police officers through through the ages. I've been arrested numerous times. Not because I'm a bad person. I feel, I feel uh, because I'm. So you're leading me down a road there because I I, I want to kind of find out about your your older life, your, oh, your sure, sort of sure, adult sure. life. Sure, but sure. now all I want to do is ask you about the number of times you've been arrested uh, and why. Stupid things. So, so look, the dumbest, the dumbest time I've been not arrested, but, but asked to uh, go to court. Uh, not asked, then, like request, could you come? <laughs> <laughs> would you mind? We'll have a cup of tea like, for you. Um, I think the dumbest one, it was really, um, I, was organi I was organizing this trainer, so by this time I was presumably an adult, right? And... <laughs> The, the, the like we I've been working like eighteen hour days, whatever. I had a girlfriend at the time I hadn't seen in a very long time, uh, so I went to this uh, this, this place after, after like one eighteen hour day called Rookies. I don't know, do you remember Rookies? It's so, a bit before my time, but I know what you're talking Rookies about. Rookies was like a, a run by a guy called Chris. Lovely place, place I used to love to hang out. Our band used to do like jam there all the time. So anyway, I turn up at Rookies. It's eleven p.m. Right, um, my girlfriend is like, I'm tired, I'm tired. I'm like, babe, like, please, fuck's sake. <laughs> like, I haven't been out in a long time. I'm about to, you know, purchase ample shots, and I, I, I need some catharsis. So anyway, she's like, okay, listen, I'm gonna go home, but don't get in trouble. She actually says this to me, like, like she's my mom. I'm annoyed that you said this to me. Of course you are. <laughs> I'm like, why? Why? Uh, no, listen, no. what age are we talking? You're saying you're working with Listrina, but we're like looking twenties. Uh, twenties, yes, okay, yes. Right, so I would okay. say um, probably about uh, I would say about twenty-four. Okay. Twenty-four, twenty-three, twenty-four. So I'm sorry, I do the dumb. Anyway, so uh, so she leaves, and literally as soon as I, I see her car drive off, two police cars roll up to rookies. I'm like, what are police doing here? You know, like the, the, the club, the, 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 the bar wasn't, wasn't rammed. It was maybe like 50% full. I've just bought, you know, numerous tequilas, whatever. Um, and I'm about to have, you know, have me a good time. And I was speaking to, I don't know, do you know Nikki Gravino? Yes. So I, me, me and Nikki were best friends okay. right at the time. And, and Nikki, uh, being the soldier that he was, and um, he stood by me, you know, he's like, yeah, yeah no, me and you will have a good time. <laughs> so I'm talking to Nikki, but from, uh, from earshot, I'm hearing these police 
telling Chris that he has to close the bar. And I'm like, oh my God, man, like tonight we're going to close the bar at 11. So I'm literally getting wound up. Presumably I was an adult. And so I'm like, like I'm, I'm having like, now I'm having an, an, an inward uh, dialogue with, with the part of myself that's just saying, just, just fuck it, go home, wasn't meant to be. And the other part saying, let's try and rectify the situation. Anyway, what that eventually, like the result that eventually emerges out of that is I walk up to the one of the police and, and, and I, I whisper in his ear, go, <gasps> yes, yes. How many tequilas were you down? No, none. What? No, no. It was just the frustration of being. I was. It was the frustration of not being down any tequilas and having like a lot of stress at work. And Nikki was like, "Oh shit!" And so the policeman turns to me and he says, "What the fuck did you say to me?" You know. And I just said, "Listen, uh, um, I." Like, I, I don't know, I, I said some really stupid things. I kept saying things like, listen, just because you're talking to me like this doesn't mean your mother's proud of you for what you've done in life. Ooh. I went, I don't know. Uh, some of those best Maltese phrases. Yes, yes, like that. And, and, and you know, the Maltese, we go straight them. for the mom. Yeah. So, uh, we go straight for Absolutely. the mom. So anyway, if, if whoever that person was is, is watching, I am deeply mortified, man. <laughs> Like, you are only trying to do your bloody job. Someone made a call. You came to have a look. And they, they were trying to, like, tell me to, like, to go with them in the car. And I was like, listen, bro, I'm not fucking coming anywhere. <laughs> now, these guys were massive. They would have destroyed me. Destroyed me. <laughs> like, I'm not fucking coming anywhere. I'm going to just sit here, and I'm not going to let Chris close the bar. Chris close the bar. And it just wound up with me going home with zero tequilas and needing to turn up in court in like two or Shit. three months' time. Yeah. But, but this is what I'm trying to understand, right? Because, John, there's this whole, what appears to be this juxtaposition. Because there is, there is this part of you that I'm seeing, even now, this part of you that is kind of, you know, I said Joe, Joe Rogan earlier on, and you were like, like, this is not the first time you've heard this, I'm absolutely certain. Yeah. And then there's this whole other side of you, because you just mentioned Lestrina, working with Lestrina, and you, I, I know that you worked with prisoners, and you've worked with teaching people to rap as, as therapy for them, and you yeah. work with disability. So how does this marry? Because you've got this, this, you've got this side of, of, of John Malia that's going around telling police officers to fuck right off, and then you've got the other part of you that's really, that is just wants to help, that wants, obviously, that's really passionate. And we sort of skipped from, mm. from your childhood to you getting arrested several times. But, but how, do we, how do you kind of reconcile those two sides of you? Because it does seem to be that those two... And we're skipping so much of your story out, mm -hmm. but I kind of want to get to that. Mm. So I, I had a... Look, I, I think maybe we could... Trace, let's tr try to trace it a bit through my childhood, because I think, I think there must be some kernels of information there that will at least provide coordinates to this to this question to to find the answer so look I, I had a terrible time at school absolutely ha hated for school i um, i couldn't i had very very pronounced adhd and and no one understood what adhd was um i felt like i was extremely stupid i felt like um I felt like I, I was just not congruent with existence itself, right? I, I would look around and see just everyone is, can understand what it means to stand in, in, in twos and everyone can understand what it means to sit for 45 minutes and listen and everyone can understand, I don't know, some, some mathematical equation that, that, that the teacher has just shown us and I could understand none of it, none of it. Um, but at the same time, there was a very, so that, um, fostered within me a, a, an abject hatred for all things related to, to structure and authority uh, and, and, and general social cooperation, right? So I became very uncooperative socially. That's why, I put, for example, okay, I'm, I'm not supposed to be nicking CDs. I'm going to go and I'm going to nick CDs. Uh, we used to go to a, a shop, again, if you're watching, God bless you, I'm sorry. Uh, we used to go to this shop called the uh, Sports Collection in Slima, for example. This, we were 10. Eh? We, were, we were like, this was grade six. 
Uh, and we used to like nick all the caps and then go to plaza and and, and sell them off. Um, but but it was I didn't care about the money. I didn't care about the money at all at all. What I cared about was. First of all, the camaraderie of thieves, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, we yeah. had we had like this little little conspiracy of guys that kind of felt like I felt, and we could just band together. And now, and you had to band because one of you stepped out <coughs> and 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 kind of spoke out against the rest of you. You would all be screwed. So eventually that, we were. That, eventually, oh eventually shit, we, really? we we badly were. Oh dear. Um, and 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 there was. The the, 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 the the solace and the comfort that you find from, you know, being part of a group um, and being accepted and having like some value structure that you share and and now you're valuable because you're you're really good at distracting the sales girl, bro. Huh? You're really good at that. So now you at least you have now you're having some worth. Plus we're all kind of a bit funny, a bit cocky, a bit daring. Um, and that was the currency, rather than what did you get on your physics exam, you know? Um, so there was, that gave me that, and it also gave me the thrill of being completely counterculture. So whatever society expects from me, I'm gonna do the opposite, right? Um, and that was cathartic, but obviously it's very uh, self-destructive. Mm -hmm. It's a very self-destructive stance to take with society and with yourself as an, uh, an individual. Um, but there was a lot of pain there. There was a lot of pain there. And um, Did your parents know that you had ADHD? Did they know what was they, going they on? They didn't realize. No, they didn't realize. They didn't realize. Uh, they just... I, look, my... Mm, the culture, so first of all, the culture at the time was very different. Yeah, of course. Like, they wouldn't have all of this um, kind of the mental health uh, awareness and, and, you know, all this access to, to resources in schools and on, in the media and stuff like that, which is why it's good that we keep talking about mental health. I, I, I feel like... Um, I feel like nowadays uh, we have gotten to a good place with mental health. For example, I don't know, do you follow the UFC at all? Yeah. So there was, um, um, I forget the name of the fighter, but, but this, this fighter that uh, won his fight, and as soon as he won his fight, uh, Gimblet, uh, I believe his name was. Um, very, and he's, this guy is known for being very braggadocious and very cocky. And, uh, but at the end of the fight, he broke down into tears because the night before, his friend had just hung himself. Right? Um, but this was, what, the importance of that moment was that um, this is the UFC. This is like, this doesn't get, it doesn't, there's no place on planet Earth that could be more alpha male right. than, than, than the UFC. Yeah, yeah. So to have um, someone that's just been, uh, is being venerated by that crowd to also speak about male vulnerability. Yeah. For me, that made me feel, that's a, that's, that, that's, that's a, a moment that kind of exemplified where we are historically with mental health, which I feel is a good place. Now, to go back to my uh, my experience with, with, with my, they didn't, like, people didn't really know. They just thought, uh, he's naughty, you know, he, there's no, there's no correcting John. Um, to be fair, in Form 3, there was this one headmaster. Uh, there were a few, uh, like a headmaster and a few teachers that really understood what, what I needed, you know, and could, could, like, pierce the armor, had this really, uh, incredible talent that I, I still actually have onboarded a lot of, of their, of their skill set nowadays. When I, I've worked in schools, as you were saying, I've worked with prisoners, I've worked with all, all kinds of people that kind of have become marginalized by some measure. Um, and, 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 and those people were very, very, uh, they managed to get to the authentic person. Right, and you at a point you realize that not even you yourself were living out of a persona that you were pretending to be this person that really the person inside is not, and some people that that can pay a lot of attention uh, and that are courageous enough have the ability to simply slice through that persona and get to the heart of the person, and 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 I did have those experiences um, over time I had more of them which is why then I eventually kind of managed to get my shit together and and not be dead because I'm very I'm, I'm quite surprised that I'm not dead I'm I'm quite um, 
like w when I revisit certain stories or when I, I meet old mates and we have a, a talk about, you know, the, the, the three day bender that was just, you know, like every measure of insanity and we survived it. We kind of look at each other like, wow, you know, like we're, we're, we're still around. Best, best do a good job now, you know, now that, that, that we've been spared life. For those willing to change the world one step at a time. For those dreaming of sustainable living. For those striving to find a healthier balance. For those always believing. Browns and Viridian. Love the planet, love yourself. So, you know, because you've just, again, it's like talking to you. I'm thinking in my head, I want to know more about this. I want to know more about this. I want to know about this. But what you've just said there has kind of contextualized where then your journey took you. Because you yourself said you had, and, and you can see from, from anybody that looks into what you've done, you have a passion for marginalized people. You have a passion for... Uh, people that are in prison, or you have a passion for people with disability, you have a passion for anybody who feels like they on, are on the outside of society and are not accepted, and however they got there. And that kind of is very understandable now, you just telling me your story and about the ADHD and not being successful at school and having had that kind of getting into that kind of Oliver artful dodger gang of stealing stuff and, yeah. and, and explains a whole load of stuff. So I want to continue. I, I love that because I can see you singing, you know, something from Oliver or something from, you know. The, the, I used to love it. I used to love it. Really? I used to love that. Can you break out a song for us? Can I? I'll do anything for you, dear. Yeah. There you that's go. as far as it goes, though. Special moment. <laughs> um, but then, let's... The thank things you. you're getting me to do on this show <laughs> through the care. <laughs> oh, and we've only had coffee. But so many things that you're saying also resonates, and, and just where you said that you sit down with your friends and you're like, geez, I don't even think that we were going to make it this far. I, I get that. I understand that. And I think that that also opens up your mind to being much more compassionate mm -hmm. and more interested in people. So let's go back. So then you, I just I want to follow the story along because you've then got into carrying on from this hip hop. You had your career in hip hop. Then you've, as far as I'm, have been able to follow your trail, you're also a writer, a producer Correct, for yeah. one of the most fantastic Maltese films. I love Limestone Cowboy, but you've done other work as well. You also have, then we've sort of interspersed this with work with disability. I mean, where does all of this passion coming from? Is there a John Malia plan of action or is all of these opportunities just open doors and you've said, you know what, I'm going to do that. I'm going to take that. It, it sits with my narrative. It sits with who I am. I'm going to take it or make it happen. How's that? What, what's that? Mm. Okay, so, so uh, John Malia up until, let's, up until Limestone Cowboy had one frame of mind. John Malia post Limestone Cowboy had a different frame of mind. Oh, okay. Okay. Pre Limestone Pre Cowboy was pretty much that. Yeah, I'd say yes to anything. So when I, ca I, I had I gone, I spent a year in the in the UK just to clean up. Yeah, in uh, London. Yeah, right? yeah, weirdest place to go and clean up from cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> <There's> like, <laughs> it didn't work for me. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, so, uh, but but for me, actually, all I needed was to kind of be away from all the triggers, all the visual triggers, and my my friends and bless my friends, I still love them till this day. Very just wild, uh, but so I spent a, a year in London, and then when I came back, so I, I spent a year like just being vegetarian and doing a bunch of meditation, like meditating hours a day, and um, just having a regular job. And hang on like a that. second, I'm going to stop you there because suddenly, just I'm thinking to myself, you were party boy, wild boy, but still being Mister Helpful, still having compassion and doing good things for community and that sort of thing, but also having this, what made you say, I need to clean up? My mother, oh. My mother, like hurting my mother. How, what, what? what, what? Uh, she, uh, it was communicated to her, like she knew that I was, um, she knew that I was doing drugs on and off. And I would lie to her and say, okay, listen, it was, there was this one time that we did it, you know, you know how to go, that's the story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, there was kind of a, a 
a family situation whereby I did a lot of drugs in a certain particular kind of context. She found out. And, um, age? age. Uh, this was 26. Okay. Um, and I saw how we just, it just took her soul, man. It just destroyed the strongest person I, I ever knew. And I just saw the bastions crumble. And I said, ah, oh, fuck, I did that. Fuck, I did that. So I, I got my mom in the car. I went to where, I, where I, my, my, my stash was, where I, where I used to hide my drugs, which was, which was, you know, a good amount because I used to do a lot of drugs. And I had her watch me flush the drugs away. And from there, I, I, there, I fucking turned it around. Eh? I fucking turned it around, bro. And That's that, an incredible that testimony to your relationship with your mum, but your respect for your mum as well. Mm. So then you turn things around. Then you go, of all places, to, to London. You come back and you're meditating. And so what happens from there? You've got your cleaned up life. Did you still yeah. have contact with your friends? Uh, were, you, were you avoiding the places that you'd I was go avoiding to? the places, but as I said, I love my friends. Um, so we'd have online contact a bit, um, but not, not as much. And mo most of them have now are fine, you know, like most of them have cleaned up and uh, they got on with their lives and have kids and everything else. Um, but when I came back, so I came back, first of all, I, had, I discovered this place in London called Alperton. Do you know Alperton? Alperton, yeah. yeah it's yeah. like out west. Yeah, and it's yeah, all, yeah. Um, I, think, I think they're all Bengali there. Anyway, there, there's like a, like you, you go, like the high street is like a... Of all a, the places you, I thought you were going to say, it would not Alperton, have been that. Alperton, right? <laughs> so in Alperton, you go, you go down the high street and it's like a Costa's, McDonald's, a Barclays, an HSBC, a Burger King, and then all of a sudden this huge Hindu temple. And then it's just like the high street just continues. Like, whoa, what is this? And it was like carved out of some sort of sandstone, not like our limestone, but similar. It was just beautifully carved out. And at the time I was, uh, I was um, practicing a lot of Kundalini yoga and pacing meditation and things like that. So I just stepped into this, into this, uh, into this temple. And anyway, I, I fell in love with the, with the people there. And I wound up um, going to, to the, the shops there where you can just buy, you know, buy these, their traditional robes. So I spent I spent most of my time in London running around in like traditional um, I forgot what they're called the the, the dresses there's there was a, a the kaftans yes yeah. yes so I ran around London in kaftans then I came back Malta dressed in kaftans everyone obviously thought I was a pretentious shit you know <laughs> which I was which I was you know and I was like um, and, and and the first one of the first things that I did I, I went to my sister's office uh, Abigail and at the time she was my sister is just as crazy as I am, but she's afraid of drugs. Thank okay. God, thank God. Because she's just as motivated and driven and, um, and just bullheaded, right? And anyway, so at the time she was, she was running uh, Dacia Duty, which was the hit show of the era. And uh, they started running another show called uh, Minimusu in yeah. tandem, which was given the size of their workforce, what Maltese TV pays. There is horses at hand. This was the kamikaze suicide mission, right? So basically, I, I, I walked into their office, which was just like a terraced house in Nashar, which they'd converted to an office because they couldn't afford a real office. And, um, and it was just like conflict, conflict all the time. And here's John Malia walking in barefoot. By the time there was a point, I spent four years barefoot. I'll tell you about that if, if it comes up. And so I walk into the office with my white kaftan and, uh, you know, my blonde hair and kind of thinking I'm Mahatma Gandhi or something. Oh, guys, guys, why are you fighting? Like, what, what's this conflict about? Conflict isn't good. They're looking at me like, what the fuck is wrong with John? Because... You know? <laughs> John is not the non-conflict guy. Sorry, but I'm totally you know? that funny. And uh, so, so then I, um, I'm like, guys, you need to kind of slow down. You need to see if you can get another writer on board, you know, because this is way too much work. Anyway, I'm off to Busquets to talk to the birds. Bye. So I go off to Busquets. 
and I'm under the tree, just uh, just zenning out and thinking, you know, I'm one meditation session away from becoming the Buddha, and I receive a phone call, and it's Carlos, my sister's my sister's business partner. He says, listen, 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 we, you know, we thought about your idea that we should get a new writer on board, and we really think that that's the right way to go. I'm like, yeah, well done. Well, uh, this I'm going to go back to meditation. He's like, no, 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 the writer is you. Can you come to work for us? I'm like. Shit, no, I don't want to work. <laughs> like, I'm really I'm happy enjoying with my this. Thank you. I'm right, yeah, yeah, in the center. So um, then, I like Carlos is one, Carlos is one of the most charming human beings you'll ever meet in your life, and he charmed me into working for Take Two as a writer, um, and that's how it kind of started. I started writing uh, first. I used to write sketches for for Minimisu. Um, and then, and we still also write a couple of songs for Minimisu. And then eventually, uh, what, but while I was there, I made it a point, okay, if I'm going to be here, I'm going to figure out a way to get these people to kind of do something uh, ambitious that they'd always been saying they want to do anyway. Like they've been saying, like, we want to make a movie, we want to make a movie, we want to make a movie. So I was like, okay, so guys, when are you making a movie? You know, when are you making a movie? And, and, um, and that's how eventually Limestone Cowboy came to be, from me being around this fucking hellhole of a, of a work experience, which taught me a lot, uh, because working under that level of duress, as you well know, kind of you grow a certain kind of stamina. Um, but that's how then eventually we started spending, you know, let's say the Saturday and the Sunday, rather than working on Minimiso and the Shaduti, we would start figuring out how we're going to finance this movie, writing the movie. Um, and, and eventually we, we, we produced Limestone Cowboy. But concurrently, I had also said yes to my friend Matthew Randon, and we were doing educational campaigns. I was working 24 hours a day, literally. Uh, we were running, uh, doing educational campaigns in schools about recycling and then about proper use of traffic. And at the same time, I won the... Like some president, the, the president's premier, Shahaja, you know the one, president's yeah, premier, yeah. to start teaching um, rap. Is, this was one of my favorite projects I've ever done in my whole life. Uh, rap in prison and rap in schools, right? Um, but the, the, the idea behind it wasn't for me to teach how to rap. Well, it kind of was, but mainly it's like, all right, you have an idea. How do you? articulate that idea? Is it the only one way you can articulate that idea? Or are there like a million other ways for you to explore how to say the same thing you're telling me right now? What's a metaphor? Why is metaphor cool? When is metaphor a bit too much? And 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 having these kinds of, of, of sessions. So so I did a lot of work in, in prisons. In prison, for example, it was only a 12-week project that I was meant to do. But then I just kept going and going out of my own volition for about, I think, two years. Right, and I was like persuading people to give me money to buy a studio. I had set up a studio in, um, I had set up a studio in prison uh, for the youths. Um, I had set up a small library for them. So, for example, like if um, today at the end of the session, you know, we all go get to pick out a book, and then next week you give me a summary of what that book is about, or, and we'll just like talk about like a book club, but for prisoners that want to rap. Right? There was a point, there was a point in, in, uh, in, at the U.S. prison, which is the one in Mtahlep, right? Not the, yeah, not, yeah, not the one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where they used to open, like I used, I used to get there, they used to frisk me. Um, at that po- by that point, it was like, because they had to, because like I had become part of the staff, basically. And they, used to, they used to open the first gate, and you hear, like, like you hear the murmur. And then you open the big gate, and <laughs> Like, there could not be a time when you go visit that prison where hip-hop wasn't playing full-on and the kids that were the most problematic were constantly, constantly inside the studio trying to figure out the next, the next couple of bars, the next verse, the next hook, what beat to use. It was, the, the energy is so good, the energy around. See, see this answers a question I was going to ask you, which is which was about which of the all of the different things that you've done is the one that you're most proud of or the one that you most enjoyed. We're going to come back to your now, your planned journey post Limestone Cowboy in a second, because I want to stay with this for a minute. Sure. Because you've just said 
is one of the projects that you've enjoyed the most. You've gone into to prisons. You've I know the prison in Antalya, but it's it's like remote. It's a it's a long drive out though. That takes time and dedication to do that. So what was I kind of feel like I don't even need to ask, but what was driving you to do it? And what did you get out of it? Why is it the thing that you're most proud of? Did you see differences in the in the yeah, inmates? So, yes, yes. Look, I am um, for for certain. So the first difference you see is a, a change in self-esteem. It's almost immediate. So we started the project. I I'd done that project so long that that project started out when the youth prison was still in the high street. And then eventually they moved to Mtahleb. So I used to, I remember that uh, when we started out in Rahal Jdid, the immediate, almost, almost like after three or four weeks, when they, because with rap you can start figuring things out pretty early and you can start feeling pretty competent if I show you a couple of things and you work at them and you decide that you're going to dedicate your time and effort and intelligence, you can, you can, immediately start like, hey, perhaps I can rap. So, and, and, and because they used, to, they used to spend, they didn't have much else to do with these people. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Why are so busy? So, so, and that was the joke at the end of each session. So, Isma, you'll all come back next week. <laughs> <laughs> they love me, really. They love me, really. Um, and, and so, because all the other inmates we're hearing them rap and watching the way they carry themselves and spending all that time in the music room. Now they were calling some of them, oh, I'm a rapper, I'm a rapper. Um, and you could see that now they've added a new dimension to their identity, which isn't delinquent, that's here for burglary, that, but also a rapper. Oh, I have some value. I have some value outside of the sphere of criminality. And you can really see that they start carrying themselves differently, that, they, that their um, pursuits throughout the day start becoming different. They don't want to get in trouble because they're not going to be able to be sent to the music room. So shut the fuck up and switch off the TV because the boss said we have to switch off the TV. Let's go to bed because tomorrow I want to go to music. And that, um, that, that, I think, really, really kind of resonated with me because I also had this kind of experience with, with art um, that uh, kind of tells you that you have, you have value outside, outside uh, or more value than you thought. Um, so the reason I kept doing it, I guess, was because we were seeing, we were seeing people, people change and people's priorities change. And I could, you know, there were some of them that were very talented um, and very charismatic. I'm not going to tell you who, but but there's people that were in Limestone Cowboy that were that were people I'm, that were prisoners that I was working with. I was like, bro, your charisma is too fucking good. Like you're going to have to come on screen now. Like, no, 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 you're going to have to do it. And and they acted in in, in Limestone Cowboy. Um, so. The motivation was, I, I guess there's, I, I guess there's also a bit of mirroring. I don't know. If, are you familiar with the Jungian concept of the shadow? And so I think there was a bit of that, right? Um, and I realized that you were probably familiar the way that you traced my own marginalization with my penchant for trying to yeah, help people course. that are marginalized. So I think there was that. You know, I'd, I'd wished for someone who was perhaps some sort of paternal force in my life that could say, man, you're worth something. You're worth something. Let's figure out what that thing is. I probably, I needed that, and I was glad that I had identified that that's a thing that I could give to these people. And seeing my efforts result in people, people's lives actually meliorating, uh, so then what happened? Of... I mean, they just told you, you know, to stop turning up, John. No, then Limestone Cowboy happened. There you go. So Limestone Cowboy happened, and Limestone Cowboy was um, the most bittersweet experience of my life. So this is the point that you mentioned a little while ago that changed your path between just accepting everything and then after Limestone Cowboy, you said this is the plan. What happened... With Limestone Cowboy. So there, there, there's parts of Limestone Cowboy which I'm exceedingly proud of. The, you know, that they have 
managing to do it, you know, with with, um, with very limited resources, um, you know. And it's brilliant. I mean, it is a brilliantly written piece. I, I feel like I should have waited a few more years before I before I wrote it. Um, I feel like there are there's there's some tensions that should have been explored um, more thoroughly, and, and 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 there were some exercises in there that I felt like as a, a team of writers we could have done better. But but um, we succeeded in in producing a feature length movie, which is very rare in Malta. Uh, we succeeded. I think my my sister's work as a director. I think her in her. Uh, I think Malta really got to understand my sister's capacity for intention with the camera and 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 every frame. You could just pause lamps. You could just look the other way and pause limestone cowboy, and it's and it's a painting. It's a painting. Plus the musical score is is phenomenal. Phenomenal. Uh, plus um, again, there, you know, we had to, to raise capital for this thing and. Um, so all in all, it was quite positive, but we misread the market completely, right? So the, 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 the foreign language cinema market was shrinking at a very fast rate. Now it, it basically barely exists. Um, and what was, what was, you know, the only people that, that were selling their movies were, you know, the big blockbusters like Marvel, so on and so forth. And series were becoming the place where the bigger companies were investing their money. So when we went to markets, which was Berlin, the first market we went to with this movie that was, you know, um, foreign language, but foreign, foreign language. We're not talking like Spanish or Chinese, you know, Mandarin. No, we're talking some 14th century Arabic shit, bro, you know. They're like, oh, I get it, you know, it's fantastic. It's really, like, we got some very good feedback about it. And I'm like, listen, but like the market is shrinking, cinemas don't have place for this, cinemas are closing down. So like, la, 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 we spent, I, I think I blocked out how many hundreds of thousands of euros that fucking thing cost. So anyway, I, I worked on, on this movie for a good five, six years of my life, and only, only to wind up with a huge financial deficit. Yeah. There was a point where, I mean, there was a point where the government was sending me bloody boxes of tin sausage and, and oats because I had no money. I, I was out. I was out fucking cold. At the same time, I'm having my daughter. Eh? At the same time, I'm having, I'm having my baby daughter. So, so at that point, I was like, okay. So you, and you've already got one yeah, I, I, at I this point as well. Jeez. Yes. Um, so I'm like, dude, what the fuck are you doing? Like, uh, you're such... And that's where depression really hit, huh? obviously, as a man that can't provide, that not only can't provide, but that feels, mm, you, I, you, I felt strengthless. So not only could I, did I have no money and, and ma a massive financial, gaping financial hold, but I also had, uh, my assessment of myself was complete failure. So getting out of bed was, was but, it. But, a failure because, I mean, I'm assuming because it commercially mm. was challenged. Because as a, as a piece of cinema, no one's going to dispute that it's fantastically brilliant. You said so yourself. No, I don't think it's fantastic. So I don't think it's fantastic, right? Okay. So I think it's good. Right. But I think it could have been far better. So I'm also a very... I feel like I'm a very sober critic of my work. There's stuff, I'm not gonna sit here and say there's things that I, like, like no, nothing I've ever done, it's all shit, and I'm like, I'm not melodramatic in that sense. But um, there are things that I did that I really like. There are things that I like, and there are things I fucking hate. Uh, but with Lime Song Cowboy, I like it, but I fucking hate the, the fact that we wound up just financially devastated. And, um, and and there was kind of no way out because and then then you start remembering things you start interfacing in your psyche with things like the fact that I don't have a formal education right so I'm, I'm watching my friends become notaries and oh, lawyers yeah. and things yeah. like that and like look look how fucking bad you played this game bro look how fucking terrible now you have now you have uh, kids. You can't provide because you just decided you want to be an artist because you, you just wasted the decade of your life 
face down in a pile of coke and mm, like why are you even alive uh, and i thought I, I thought i thought those things many times over and um and somehow I don't know, somehow I made it through, somehow I made it through. Then ev eventually what I decided to do, I hated the fact that I'm an artist for a while, like really loaded it. And I, I used to like hold up my daughter and half jokingly tell her like, like she was, a, she couldn't understand when she was like six months old. I was like, if you ever become an artist, I'm sending you to the monastery. Ha 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 you're going to become a banker, you're going to become a lawyer, but like in finance. And I, that's how it's still going. Um, because I, I did, I, I hated the fact that I was an artist for a while. Um, so I needed money fast because I was just monetarily bleeding out. So, I, so for about a year, um, I went and I did, I did property. I sold property for a year. Yeah. Yeah. How did that work out? Fantastic. Oh, really? Yes. Recommend it? Uh, Recommend it is a bit. <laughs> um, so I, I. But did it get you out of your hole? I it mean, got it, me out it of my got hole. out. That's that's where you're going with yes. that. Is it gave you the opportunity to get out of that hole? Not that just you... that. Not just that. So so I did get out of the hole financially, and by the end of the year, I'm winning the bonuses of the agency. I'm the best salesman there because I'm obviously very hard headed and very very driven and everything else. Uh, but it also taught me about. It taught, first of all, it taught me about the underbelly of Maltese society, right? I could interface with people that have real money and that are, and not just those people, but also in the underbelly of individuals because people will show you a persona, but the moment money is discussed, another part of their character comes out. So that gave me the opportunity to interface with that part of, of, of the character. Um, so I, I really understood uh, humanity a lot more uh, uh, through the process of selling houses. I also learned how to negotiate a lot more. So thankfully, I have I have just the natural ability to to, to, to tell a story and to, to connect with people and to to really listen to people and and and, and create uh, create conversation that is, is tends to be in some way fruitful. I'm not good with small talk. So so I create deep bonds quite fast. Um, but negotiating wasn't, a, wasn't something I was spectacularly good at. But I learned quickly. I learned, you know, when, when to talk, when to shut up. Mo mostly it's about negotiating is mostly about shutting up. Eh? Most negotiating is about just putting a zip on it and listening, listening, listening. The, one of the first things they teach you at the agency is you have uh, two ears, one mouth, so make sure at least it's like two to one that you use them. Um, so it taught me that. And then I made a bit of change that could that helped me get out of the hole. I put a deposit on a house. I bought a house, um, and I could like I remember I took my kids on a holiday for the first time, and that was that was that was very gratifying for me. And but then I started missing art anyway, you know. Then I was like, okay, I'm making I'm making more money than I've ever made in my life, and I'm and I've. And I have, at this point in my life, made money the most important thing because I've never had it, right? So now I'm thinking, so now I'm thinking money is what I should be pursuing. And there was a, perhaps a good year where money was an ultimate goal. But then I realized, bro, you still care about um, social issues, you still care about art, but now you're also a good negotiator. So what can you do? Uh, so first thing I did was, no, then I got approached by Love in Malta. Then I got approached by Love in Malta, you know, Shaggy. Yes, I do. And Shaggy is another um, human epitome of persistence. And he's like, listen, um, we have the show, Kashatur, that they used to do in, in English. And I had seen it. And I was thinking, if someone does this well in Maltese, it will take flight. Um, and, and one time, I told my wife, I told her, I bet you love and are going to call me to do this show in Maltese. Sure enough, Shaggy calls me to, to, to do the show. 
I say no, I say listen, like I was, st- I was still playing, I was still lying to myself. I was still saying, no, I'm done with art, that's it, it's, I'm not doing any art anymore, like that was another John, forget it. And then, it, and then a critical turning point happened in my life. One which I was really not expecting. So, um, Nicky Gravino, I mentioned him before. Mm-hmm. So, Nicky Gravino was uh, transitioning into an artist, a, a different artist called Miao. He did, uh, he had an album in, in the Maltese language, and he called me up. I forgot how, how, if it was out of the blue or if we'd met somewhere. He's like, listen, I have a song. Um, can you, I like, I would just like really love for you to be uh, on the intro of the song. Can you come and just do the intro of the song? And like, mate, yes, sure. For Why not? Why not? He's it, it, like, they're not even going to know it's you. He's going to, he's going to make fun. I'm like, all right, let's do it. You know, it, it would be good, a, a good occasion for me to catch up with Nikki and go to his studio and, and, you know, get a bit nostalgic because I spent a lot of hours in Nikki's studio. And so we do the part, we have a laugh. You know, he's like, listen, do you have time to listen to a couple of things? So now here I'm in my three-piece suit, ready to go to my next meeting. I'm like, you know, yeah, I have, I have 10 minutes, you know. And he plays this song called Oya Haya Kemen Hobok. I'm going to ruin it, but I'm going to try. Oya Haya Kemen Hobok. And as soon as the fucking chorus hits, I start crying uncontrollably. And I'm... I'm and this wasn't, like, I'm not understanding where this is coming from because, because I wasn't sad. I wasn't upset. I was, but there was something buried deep inside of me. They just went, I'm going to have to fucking come out now. And just, Aah! so I start crying. I'm trying to understand what's going on. Nikki is trying to look the other way. <laughs> Nikki's, like, Nikki's just like this under control. And, and, I, and, I'm like, and I'm like looking the other way. <laughs> What the fuck is going on? <laughs> so I'm crying, I'm crying, crying. And after that, I think uh, it was very clear to me that I needed to return to things that somehow were more in line with everything I knew myself to be, right? So then, anyway, so I said yes to, to Shaggy. <clears throat> yeah, it was part Shaggy. I, I credit Shaggy a lot, Shaggy's persistence particularly, uh, and Nicky Gravino. Uh, and eventually went back to, 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 uh, to Kashaturi. Uh, but I made sure, so this is what the, the whole story taught me, I made sure that it would be a financially sustainable enterprise, right? So no more... Uh, you know, making art literally for no money. Like I used to do art for mm-hmm. not just for no money. Like when I went to the, for example, when I went to the to the prison. I mean, you go you go there twice a week, right? That's your afternoon gone, right? For no money, you're spending time, money on petrol, which perhaps to most people that doesn't sound like much. But when you have zero coming in, spending money also on petrol is problematic. Um, any money that I used to be able to raise through my connections, I used to spend on equipment and things like that. There was like this exceeding, like excessive level of altruism. Um, and now, nowadays, I, I have a, a phrase in my mind by one of my favorite philosophers of all times, Jay Z. And Jay Z says, um, uh, I can't help the poor if I'm one of them, right? So I can't be in crisis and also help other people in crisis. I can momentarily, but not over for a sustainable, not for a long period of time where I can sustain this and keep doing it for the rest of my life, which is I want to keep helping people for the rest of my life. But I don't want to do that at the detriment of my own psyche. I don't want to do that at the detriment of my children's psyche. I don't want to do that at the detriment of me not having enough time to discover the love I have for my wife and all of its layers and stratospheres. Uh, so, um, so then I figured out how to integrate uh, negotiating into what I want to do into, and, and also being very discriminatory to what I say yes. I'm also very discriminatory into who I say yes to, so, so who I help, right? I don't help just anyone nowadays. I really don't. I want to make sure that 
I will go all out and help you. I will, I will move mountains for you. So for example, so for example, I don't know, there was this one kid, uh, and this is where the rugby shirt comes from, actually, El Babao. Uh, and El Babao had, had um, torn his shoulder in training. He was, a, he was a, a rugby player for Malta. Friend reaches out to me, his friend reaches out to me, says, Miss Ma, bro, the, like my friend, he needs a shoulder operation. The host, Maltese hospital will do it in like three years. That will be his career over. This guy plays for Malta. I have, I have huge respect for the for the Malta rugby movement in its entirety. I think they've done fantastic things. I think that they're, they're, they're a bunch of people I'm super fucking proud of. And uh, the friend reached out to me. I had a, one of my best friends played. So, so I, I, I know that community, you know. Not internally, more from the outside. But I know just how hard these people work and how dangerous that sport is. I mean, these, these people go out onto the pitch and they, they, they risk their lives, you know. And that guy is risking his life to wear the Maltese flag. Mm. So I felt like, all right, fuck it, I'm going to get behind this guy. So his friend, anyway, his friend reaches out to me, says, uh, tells me the story. I am on holiday at the time. And so I'm like, bro, I, I want to get be involved in this. But if I get going on this, my wife is not... You're going like, to be in trouble. She's not going to be thrilled. But then I think my, my wife wanted to go do something or I persuaded her she wanted to go do something. <laughs> and I, and, and I, I just got on, on the internet quickly and I just wrote a post saying, like describing the situation, posted the picture. And within a few hours, I think we raised about 2,000, 2000 euros, something like that, for him to get the operation. But the, the operation was, I think, double. That. So I said, he said, thank you so much, you know, for raising this. Like, we're going to try and keep uh, raising more money. I'm like, no, no, give me a second, give me a second. So I call uh, St. Thomas Hospital. Mm -hmm. And I had some connections there. I had, I had friends there. Someone actually I actually met while I was selling property. Um, and I called... and. And I called the guy up. I said, this is my bro. Like, how you been? I explained to him the story. I said, listen, I have 2,000 euros. Will St. Thomas Hospital give me the rest? Uh, like, will, will you cover the rest of that uh, financial contribution and just give this guy the operation? He's like, give me a second. Let me check. Let me check. Let me check. Calls me back an hour later. He's like, all right, we're doing it. So we saved the guy's shoulder. And we, you know, recently we went and we watched him play for Malta and things like that. But that's a guy I will go to hell's end to hell because... He's someone that's clearly trying to help himself. He's someone that, you know, trains hard, has a job, locks the job down. Those things and that's are the criteria. So, they, so when you're saying <coughs> that you are very happy to help and still have a passion to going back to that very first statement that you made in 2020, you still have this passion to help. You know, helping is what really turns you on and gets you out of the bed in the morning. But there's a criteria. Yes, to whom you will help. Yes. Yes. And that's going to stay like that. Forever, yes. Because otherwise I'm... Um, because I believe a lot in opportunity cost. If I don't have that, that level of discrimination with who I help and who I don't help, I might be helping the wrong person that's never going to pull up their socks. And whereas I could have been helping person X who just needs just needs like to come to the studio once a week, hang out with us, and we can figure out what he's going to do with his life. And, and I'm not doing that because I'm wasting my time and my energy with someone that just doesn't want to, I don't know, doesn't want to put the effort in, right? So I will, I will, I will gladly help people that are, I, will, I call them wounded lions. I like that. Wounded lions. I think that's a particularly brilliant way of putting it. Now, we've sort of brought the story kind of up to present day. We know what you're doing now. I'm going to come to future John Malia in a minute. But before we get there, because I know there was something, there's something I want to ask you about. There's actually four questions I want to ask you about. Sure. And one of them comes from you having had this Man Up camp, this project that you had uh, 2020, it was launching at the end of yeah. 2020. But then COVID just... COVID, COVID came yeah. and screwed everything for us, bless. Um, but you have this whole thing about man up, empowering men to be who they are. And this is a conversation that I keep having over and over again. I, at the moment, I'm on a mission to empower women. Mm -hmm. And I have a 
position and I've got some, you know, the right people in play at the moment where we're, we, us and the guests are creating some great content and I have to thank my guests for doing that. But every time I have this conversation about empowering women, there keeps coming back this conversation, what about the men? Mm -hmm. What about the men? Mm -hmm. And it does seem to me that we as a society are creating a lost generation of men. Agreed. And I hear this not just from people like yourselves, and I listen carefully to what you're saying, and, and, and other people, your peers, but even my husband has said to me, you know what, Trudes, when is someone going to pay attention to, to men and men who need to... And you mentioned about crying on a, on, after a, a particularly powerful sports event and about men needing to engage. We know that suicide in men is far more yeah. in Malta than women. Yeah. We know that it's on the rise. We know that COVID had a devastating effect on that. So I'm coming to you as a guy, as a guy who's connected with more men than women in your podcast. You connect with a majority of men. What is this issue that's going on right now for this, what I would refer to as this lost generation of men? What's happening and why is it happening? So this is a massive question, massive question that has that has historically rules hewn into it, sociological ones, and, and also, um, in a sense, also theological ones. So men lost, kind of lost their role in society, right? Um, for good or worse, and it's, it's a, really, it's a mixed bag. Men kind of knew what uh, was expected of them, right? They had... Uh, they're, they're the providers, they're the protectors, um, and, and, and they had at least, even though this was a very, could have been very oppressive for some males, for most males, it was very much like, okay, that's the direction in which I should go, and that's, that's, that's my role, and this is what, what I do. That, as we all know, in, in the modern era, has completely exploded because a woman, a woman can provide for herself. She, you know, the, 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 the things that were required of the, of the man within the context of the family unit are no longer a necessity. So men are now kind of stuck in this uh, limbo that is, the f that comes at the tail end of literally millennia, millennia within our DNA being those types of people. Now society is telling us, well, we don't need those types of people. Like we don't need the aggression anymore and we don't need the protector anymore. We don't need... So obviously because for every generation except two or three that precede our own, men had a very straightforward role. Now we're kind of like in a, in a hangover and, we don't, and we're very disoriented. What do you hear most people that go to therapists say? They say, I'm lost because we don't have, we don't have a direction. This is why, for example, nowadays, jujitsu clubs are rammed with people. CrossFit clubs are rammed with men. Because, because m m I think mankind in general, but I speak to the issue of men, Mankind has an, a, a natural proclivity for sacrifice. We like, like one of the main things that makes our society as incredible as it is, and, and we can debate whether it's better or worse, but by my make... estimation, <laughs> it's, it's a better society. One of the reasons that is, is that as a species, we have the capacity of sacrificing, doing things that we don't like to do now, so that the future will be better, right? And, 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 and men and women, but men in their own way, especially in, particularly in physical ways, in, in ways that, that test your endurance and mental, and mental and physical strength, used to do, used to have that role. And that used to gratify us a lot. So now what I'm seeing is that since there isn't, this, this space no longer needs to be occupied by men, Men are making the fatal mistake, 
fatal and literally fatal mistake of remaining children, of remaining boys. There's, there's a, a growing prevalence of what's called the, the Peter Pan syndrome, where they refuse to take on the adult form of their being, right? They, they remain wanting to, you know, date multiple women and cheat on women and do drugs. And, 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 and there's a reason for this, which is also tied into the cultural disdain for sacrifice. Nowadays, what's being championed mainly in our culture is, oh, you should do, you should do what makes you happy. You should do what makes you happy, which on a level sounds right. It sounds right. But if you don't espouse happiness with good values, then that happiness can come from a line of coke, it can come from cheating on your wife, it can come from all kind of, kinds of antisocial behaviors that become ultimately uh, self-destructive, destructive for your family, and socially destructive. And I think men um, are suffering because the world, it, because of all these things, and also because, because the world has now entered an, an epoch historically where more, more of a feminine temperament is needed now. And men, for a long time, for a long time, if we didn't have a masculine temperament leading, I feel, we would not get where we would have gotten because you needed the man to go and, I don't know, fight the enemy at the gate. You needed the man to go and, you know, kill the wolves if they're coming for your baby. You needed the man to lay tracks across the entire continent of America. You needed, you needed men to do all, the, all, of these, all of these physical things. But now that we've got into a, a, a place where we've remodeled the world in a way that is far safer and far more welcoming to us, to our propensity as human beings, now the, the, all these masculine traits aren't as necessary. In fact, they can be very detrimental because now, as we know, men are far, far more competitive, far more aggressive. Now we have an issue where, you know, we can destroy ourselves. Like there, we have that level of technological armaments, right? You don't want, the, like, a masculine standoffs when we are that well kitted out to destroy one another. So now I think there's, I think there's, there's a motion or rather a, there's a transition of the type of temperament we need to, to push the world forward. I think, it's, I think we need more empathy in the world. I think the next revolution we need is an empathic revolution. And I also think that men should not, I think men and women, sometimes I get this from women, where, they, where you get a sense that they resent male aggression or they resent male strength. I think that's still necessary. I think that is still necessary. But we need to identify ways in which courage and just a, a general masculine fortitude is still useful in this, in this world. And I think, I think there is still a lot of room for that, but we need to pay a lot of attention on how to hone it, and we need to tell men and people in general that the most important thing is not pleasure, but purpose. Have a purpose. If you have a, if you have a purpose, you will know what direction you need to go to at all times, even when it's fucking shit. Even when you feel miserable and, and, and you feel like a failure, but you know which way is north and, and, and you will keep walking into that northern direction. So we need to reinstill men with a new sense of purpose. That is. But you see, now we've created this very complicated dynamic. And it's not just between men and women. There's a whole bunch of other uh, complications to the gender definition going on at the moment as well. But we have created, I mean, as I said to you, I'm going through a position of empowering women. Now, I would never want that to be at the detriment of a woman having a great relationship with a guy and men in general. It's, a, it's about redefining it. But I think I absolutely agree. I can't, I can't see a world without men 
being powerful and strong. We, as women, need men to be powerful and strong. But unfortunately, what's happened is what you've just described is opening this massive void for role models like Andrew Tate or like mm. Donald Trump mm. to come along, who are the absolute antithesis of what is going to create a way forward for us as a human race, based on you saying that the world needs to have more empathy. You look at someone like Andrew Tate or Donald Trump or, or these very strong masculine figures who maybe 20, 30 years ago, we'd have gone, yeah, whatever. And now they're filling the void. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're creating their own problems. So how do we find a solution to this lost gender generation of men? Mm -hmm. I think, I think um, the Tate, Phenomenon is very interesting, eh? it's, it's, uh, because um, Tate is uh, analytically correct. Huh? He, he, he did his, his, when he combed society to see what's going on with men, he understood it perfectly. But this is the same with Donald Trump as well. There, there's an element of truth in exactly what they're saying. You can't deny that. There's an element, and any of these very strong masculine uh, mm -hmm. role models, there's an element of truth. I, but when you take that element of truth and then you blow it out of proportion into yes, something else. Yes, I think the else. prescription is then, so let's separate the, the two because I'm not that familiar with Trump or maybe, like, like I'd, ra I'd rather let's try and think of one person at a time. So Tate analytically is correct. He's, say, he's saying everything that me and you are saying, which is men are lost, men don't have purpose, men are killing themselves in droves, and men ought to, like he says, things that are, that's, resonate even with me sometimes, well, you know, just uh, like, uh, don't expect thanks. So, like, like, even if you're feeling like shit, just go and do what you know you ought to be doing. That's true. That's like, that I've implemented that in my life, not because of Andrew Tate, but because for, for other reasons. Um, and it's worked. And it worked. But what has Andrew Tate also done? Pre prescriptively, this, this is where the fuck up is with Andrew Tate. He has... He has mm, fed the most primal part of us, which is the need for domination. So he will tell you, you know this, this terrible feeling you have? Look, first of all, get your shit together. And then once you get your shit together, uh, make sure you assert the dominance over the other sex because, because you ought to be dominant. And, and that starts resonating with a very primal part of us because even when we were chimps, we wanted to dominate. We, like, us being part of a social hierarchy is who we are as, as, as social beings. So when you have someone that is, you know, um, that is doing seemingly as well as Andrew Tate telling you that, and there is something that evolution has hewn into you, which is like the darker part of you, but it's there, and it's something that the moment you speak to it, it wakes up. And, it, and as we see with Andrew Tate, it's woken up millions, millions of young men where that's where feeling lost and that we're given uh, a direction by Andrew Tate based on uh, this this uh, this evolutionary need to um, to feel to feel strong to feel empowered but obviously we're pursuing that at the detriment of one and an entire other sex which is like the female sex and and my understanding, now I'm not some relationship guru, I'm don't, I, don't even, I, I barely graduated four and five. Um, but my, my estimation is that men and women, it, while there is tension, like there is tension between me and my wife, there is a tension, there is a tension going on, but that tension is underpinned by uh, cooperation, right? We, we have, we have um, goals together. Um, and those may be material, material in the sense of like real world goals or just like let's communicate better, right? Um, and, and, but we don't agree how we're going to get there, right? But we have the same goal. We want the same outcome and we want the best for one another. We don't want to destroy each other. I don't want to subjugate my wife. I don't want to live my life with a fucking slave. I want to live my life with royalty or someone that I look up to, you know? And, 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 and that's the partner I want. I don't want someone that's a broken shell of a woman just walking around the house gloomily. I want someone that will uh, will be a counter valence to me, um, but in 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 the spirit of wanting to better ourselves as individuals, our relationship, get closer to our outcomes, raise our kids better together. 
I also think, I also think, and this may or may not be controversial uh, with the audience, that I think the, we've done way too much to undermine the family unit. I couldn't agree more. I really feel like... Couldn't agree um, more. And I, I and unfortunately, you know, th this is verging on to, to one of the other <coughs> questions I was going to ask you, but unfortunately, I don't know how we are going to get that back. In the same way, right now, you're talking about empathy, creating empathy within men as part of the future future vision for men. Mm -hmm. I don't know how we're going to be able to instill that either because I, I think it, it's not just a lost gender generation for men. I think that we as a human race right now are in serious shit. What? I want. I don't want to be negative. I don't want to be, you know, or oh, everything the light world. Why, is over, why do you is. feel? Why do you feel like? What, well, okay. Let's try to uh, uh, parse parcel the thirds. So, what what what, what about the uh, the world? Do you feel like is most urgently shit? Most most pressing and most. The, where do we need to focus our attention? Do you feel? Well, I'm going to ask you that. Because okay. I, I, can, I can tell you what I think, but I'm most interested in what you think. Okay. We talked about, you know, I wanted to ask you about, just I'm giving up, I'm showing you my cards right now, the challenges that face men, the challenges that face Malta, the challenges that face the world, and the challenges, challenges that face John Malia. We've skipped from men to the world. Mm -hmm. You tell me what you think are the three most pressing challenges for the world right now. For the world? I for us as a human race. Okay, for, for us, for us as, as humanity. I think, look, I think we are... Uh, all right, let, let me try. I'm going to try and take you on a roller coaster, okay? Uh, if, if this does not work I'm out... I'm holding on. If, if this does not work out, we can just cut this out because this might sound a bit cuckoo. So, so every, let's say, three to four months, I have... I have uh, my, my subconscious visits me, okay? So... And it visits me in dreams, and dreams that are very archetypical. And they're so they're so powerful that I have to wake up and I, I must write them. I am forced to write out these dreams at three in the morning, um, and they tend to be exceedingly symbolic um, dreams. So um, here's the issue. So you have. So the dream I had was this. Um, I was I was sitting at the back of the bus with another few. A few other men. We, 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 I was. I felt exhausted, and I felt like I was almost withering away with exhaustion. Like I, they're, they're, like I was fading. Okay, and and there were another four or five men, all dressed in grey, also feeling like they are, uh, like emaciated, like like existence is just peeling away at them. Um, at the front of the bus is um, Carl Jung. Right, and I'm like, and I walk up to him, like he's he's, I th he wasn't the the driver, he was like the conductor. You know? It's just like a long empty bus. And I walk up to him, and I say, ah, "Bro, listen, I'm this moral life you have me leading, um, it's too fucking tiring. Um, I'm done being a moral human being, and please kill me, because I'm done." Uh, just, just please, and, and this would be a mercy killing. I'm not even asked, like, this is not me dramatizing. I just need this to be over because it's very tiring now. And he turns to me and he says, no, 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 just one more stop. One more stop. What the fuck are you talking about? One more stop. So then, um, then I, I look around and I'm like, and I see like that at the end of this, street there is like greener pastures and that's when i wake up so carl jung spoke spoke at great length about um, how religiosity has affected like our relationship with morality um, and while while I'm, I'm not the type of person that thinks that without religion we can't be moral uh, moral beings i am also of the understanding that for a very long time, because we are symbolic beings, re religion housed the morality inside it and explained it to us in a way that we could understand the metaphor. So for me, God is, God may be a number of things, but a few things that God definitely is, 
So good is one, an ideal to which we should look at and try to kind of behave. So we, we, we took a set of ideals that create better social cohesion and harmony, install them in one being that we call a god, and we say, okay, we should all aim uh, through these tablets of Ten Commandments to be closer to what that guy wants because, but really it's because when we have more of that kind of behavior, we have better society. So we all live better lives, right? If I'm not fucking the guy's wife and I'm not stealing from him, I'm not lying under oath, um, and we're not all doing that, then our society is going to be objectively a better society, right? Um, so aside from that, then there's the idea of the spirit. So the spirit of God is social cohesion. It's harmony, right? When we're all okay with one another, generally it's never going to be utopic, perfect. That is when there is the spirit of God. When you don't have the spirit of God, when we're all thieving and fornicating and, and, and just being deleterious, uh, then you get something that approximates more hell, right? Where there is no trust. Like, I don't know if you've ever been, for example, to the slums in Naples, for example, right? Where that's just been allowed to run wild, right? So, so you have something that approximates uh, hell, hell a bit more. Um, so the, what I'm going to get to, and maybe this is a bit of a leap, was that then while I'm writing this out, I got a flash when I recalled a podcast I was listening to by Micho Kaku. Micho Kaku is a, is a physicist. Um, recently, he's been writing a lot about quantum physics and quantum computing, particularly. And um, Micho Kaku, like that, over the course of a three-hour podcast, made one uh, very important insight. Right. So the notion is that once we figure out quantum computing, we will understand things at a very deep meaning, at a very deep level, almost as an entire level of things like time. Uh, it will help us uh, resolve, uh, hack biological codes, so like cancer will be a thing over the past. Um, and and, and it, we become what's called a type one civilization, right? These quantum scientists, they have different types of civilizations. And we are right now like a 0.75 type of civilization, but we are close to becoming a type one civilization. We will be able to hack all of these things and have like, like the question of time, for example, that we've been asking ourselves as a humanity since we first turned up on planet Earth. It's about to be resolved, right? Like, like through quantum computing. But he also said, the important part is this actually. He said, the same uh, society that can figure out the longest standing human questions is the same society that in a second can destroy itself. It's the same one, right? So if you live immoral and, we, and, and you are contributing to the possibility of society tipping closer towards hell, and when we have this technological capacity to either resolve ancient human problems or destroy, our, destroy ourselves, we will choose to destroy ourselves, mm. right? So the, the dream was about that. So it's about, no, 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 listen, there is actually a universal reason of why you should live a moral life. And it's nothing to do with metaphysical religious books, but it's all to do with it, it, there has been a drive for humanity to figure these things out ever since mankind uh, appeared on planet Earth and asked, but why? But what? But uh, we are getting closer to answering those questions that we've never answered. But if we do not live morally in a critical enough mass, what will happen is that on the, on the point of answering those fucking important questions, all those those questions that have tormented so many generations before us, we will instead choose to destroy ourselves. How fucking sad would that be? So I think this need to this is now my this is now my hypothesis, right? But it's this need that that arises um, within us to be kind to one another, and that, this resonates greatly with me. Um, arises from the fact it's something in our DNA that is telling us 
guy, might not be your generation, but please don't fuck up mankind because there is an end to this, there is a happy ending to the story. So can you just be all nice to each other so we can get to that happy ending? Um, and that is, um, I think that is one of the main things that mankind should be preoccupied about right now because technology is just skyrocketing in a way that I don't even understand. Um, that has some obvious threats and opportunities. Uh, so if we decide that morality is not objective and there's no such thing as right and wrong, which the last few decades have been tipping us towards that, 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 that mode of thinking, I feel, and maybe I'm being nostalgic, maybe we've always been like that, but it doesn't matter. If we believe that morality is unnecessary, once that huge power is wielded, we can really start pushing it, in the, pushing it about in the wrong direction. And if we don't hold our decision makers accountable to using that power properly and in the interest of everyone, and, and we should, like, the, 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 the outcomes of this will be fucking disastrous. Disastrous. How hopeful are you? Uh, hopeful, done. Yeah. Very hopeful. I know it sounds like. <laughs> no, but you mentioned something there that just kind of I just kind of immediately jumped on in my mind. If if that there is the potential for us to change uh, the course of history because we'll be able to work out the solution to cancer, for instance, mm -hmm. you think pharmaceuticals are going to allow that? Look, I'm not as. Uh... I don't know enough about that part of the story. What I do know is that uh, mankind has uh, a great uh, mankind has a great capacity uh, capacity talent for for finding a way. So in in, in a far smaller um, a far smaller example, uh, but my life has been a, has been kind of testament to that. There's no way that, I don't know, the TVM would have had my podcast on. There's no way in fucking hell that would have ever existed. Uh, but because man has a need to communicate as freely as possible, we invented the internet. So then that renders, you know, huge companies like HBO and CNN that we thought would, we, we, we thought these people are, are always going to hog uh, communication and, and news yeah. and broadcasting, and you would have to, blow, pardon me, like you yeah, have to sleep with someone to get on TV, right? Now it's like, keep your fucking TV, man. Joe Rogan, since we've mentioned Joe Rogan, has a viewership that is 10 times larger than any of the corporations. Yep. A guy much like Dan us. Carson just been, been taken off TV in the US and immediately gone and has skyrocketed his viewership in exactly the same way. Ditched off Fox, ended up being much, much more popular yes, yes, yes. on YouTube. You're absolutely right. And that, in that millisecond, has given me hope because that pointing that out actually does work. I can see that. What if you could start your journey over? Start here and start again there. That's how life works, in a circular way. We understand the importance of circles, and that's why you are at the heart of ours. Find your way to wellness with Browns. I'm going to bring that local. Sure. Because we're working our way to. I'm not towards... sure which one's mine is yours, which no, one's yours, and I think there's drool of ours. <laughs> <laughs> we're sharing. We're sharing spit and mucus this afternoon. Um, but let me bring that to a local level because we also, <clears throat> we've talked about the challenges of men, we've talked about the challenges of, uh, of the, the, the planet of humankind and you've offered wisdom on both of those. Malta, I've been here 17 years. Mm. Malta has seen phenomenal change mm -hmm. in 17 years. Mm -hmm. Do you still have the same optimism for Malta that you have for the human race? Again, yes. Good. Say, yes. But uh, let me tell you why. I interviewed with Herman Greck. Uh -huh. And Herman said to me in that, that interview, in that podcast, he said, Malta has passed the point of no return with regards to so many areas, specifically construction, environment. 
you know, social, you talked about family and the, the degradation of family, the way that families are breaking down, the way that society is re reforming itself. And it's gone past a point of new re no return. Now you've just suggested actually, then society has a way of evolving into finding its new path. So is that how you feel for Malta? Are we going to see a new Malta? Are we going to, 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 to be able to see a brighter future? So, Or is it just not that gloomy? No, it's fucking gloomy right now. Right now it's raining cats and dogs. So, I mean, I think Herman's why? right. Why? I think Herman's right on many of the assessments. So I think um, many of the things, you, uh, construction is it's gone off the, the charts. It, it's, it's, just, uh, it's, it's just like this behemoth beast that's just been allowed to run rampant on the country and just redesign the country in whatever way this construction monster decided it wanted to, to kind of uh, put our urban landscapes together. Um, and in so doing, destroying the fabric many times of our villages. I think aesthetically we are very fucked. I think, I think aesthetically we're going to need to figure out how to redo all this because, um, because it's ugly. There's no other way of looking. I mean, you could be Steve Wonder, you can still look at it and go, oh fuck, this is horrendous, you know? <laughs> uh, but, but we will, but, but, so that is a problem that we will figure out. I, I have a, a, a strong belief in, first of all, I have a strong belief in the Maltese. So we are, let's not forget, eh? let's not forget, we're a tiny island, the, the, the size of a pebble in the middle of the Mediterranean, and we, yet we are the only nation, full nation cuisine, even for example, and Cyprus is split in two. Um, all the other nations, Lampedusa, Elba, um, Sicily, even they all belong to someone else. We're like, fuck you, we're doing our own thing, we're gonna figure this out. Now that is at once audacious, um, a bit stupid, but, um, but if I know anything about stupidity or audacity, it's my, it's my life. And, and eventually you would stumble around and, 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 and pain, I feel like, I feel like with enough pain, change will, is, bound to, is bound to happen if, if you find the right guidance. Now, the guidance is gonna have to come from mostly, mostly from other Maltese people, right? From, we need good decision makers. We need people that give a fuck. And not only just give a fuck, not only just like, go, he's sincere, therefore parliament. No, okay, sincere is just like entry level. Like I'm hoping the person, the first person I employ to be my top civil servant is not gonna rob me blind. That's, that's, that's like a, a given, right? Uh, but also who are the smarter people? Why aren't they, like I have my biggest concern right now, which can be mitigated if we really try, is why are the best people in this country not going, getting into politics? Why are the smartest people I meet leaving the country? They are, they are. Like the, 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 the smartest engineers, the smartest people that I know in, 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 in business, the smartest people I, I know in almost every avenue are, are well, they're leaving the country and in why? droves. Why? Because, because look, there's an issue of, there's an issue of where, where we're agreeing right now, it's ugly. Um, there's the other issue of, and we have very corrupt hierarchies here, right? That, that there is no meritocracy to get to the top. It's not how competent you are in many spheres, in many spheres, not all of them, but in many spheres, particularly when it comes to the public sector, there are many of these hierarchies that, are, that you know, ascending to, to the helm of that hierarchy it relies on the ability to, to, to lie and or the ability to shut up or the ability to kiss the right bottom um, and shut up and lie and do every, uh, and if you can do all those at once, you're going straight to Vegas, babe. And, um, and that is problematic because, because people want to look at themselves in the mirror, you know? The people that are moral and competent are like, fuck this, I'm leaving, right? I know, I know people working on the Da Vinci project that are my Patreons. I know people that are doing incredible marine biology work in Australia that are my Patreons. 20% of my patronage, so I have this, this Patreon page. 20% um, of them are, are abroad. 20% are abroad. And, and I write to them, like, why do you give a fuck, man? Why do you still give a fuck? You have a great life. You have a great life, you know, great prospects. You're in Sweden working in finance. Why? Because it's still my country, my roots are still there. 
Like, and, they, and many of them tell you, you know, these people fucked it up and I left. But now I'm thinking they should leave. Well, there you go. There's your solution, right? Yes. So now, where I, so I get courage and heart from the fact that I, the, I speak to these people often. And the fact that the fact that the podcast has so much um, social, such a strong community around it of competent people that really want to kind of see, and they and they have my patreons and 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 the people that follow the podcast tend to have very differing ideologies. So every few weeks we have what we call like debate evenings where I invite 40 or 50 Patreons and we have a meal together and then we do debates. And you realize just how different these people are ideologically. Some people are on the left, some people are on the right, some people are capitalists, some people want more socialism. Some but they all want fairness. They want better dialogue. They want more transparency in government. Uh, they want us to, and another thing that is really now coming up often, is they want us to, and I want this to, to steer away from parochial politics and realize that we're part of a, a, a globe that is embracing technological modernity that is this the, the idea that we are still two parties point scoring with one another and rather than doing what's best for the country in the long term but doing what's best to get me an extra couple of votes in the next election is very frustrating to people and it become and and, and it becomes very frustrating so I speak, for example, to, to, to a lot of businessmen. I speak to a lot of businessmen. This is another thing that, that also gives me heart. So, uh, so one thing I do as well is I, I organize retreats, right? Um, whereby about, I, I take a number of select people off to some secluded area and we just debate for two, for two days. And sometimes, and, like I invite businessmen there to see what they're thinking, right? Um, doesn't matter how much money they have, they still don't want to be governed by people that are ruining the self-esteem of a country. That is a problem. If that's the case, if your demographic that engage with you are feeling like this, uh -huh. if that's what they want, where does the tipping point lie? Where is when is that going to kick in? I mean, we've we've seen, I've seen a change, even if it's a one degree, a change of temperature, mm. because of what's happening at the moment. Because there's because general people, not your your audience, audience which, which oh, with all due respect, are probably you know preaching to the converted because if they're listening to you, they already want to to, to they're mm -hmm. open to change. Mm -hmm. But I'm seeing a one temperature, a one degree change in the population who would be very defensive of of the government that's in power at the moment because of the impact that recent events with vitals and stewards and, and environment and so on is having on them. Mm -hmm. So as you realize, I've, I've slowed down in my speech. And the reason is because I've been part of a number of conversations and I'm like, okay, what can I not say? What can I keep with oh, it? Of course. So, so there's very exciting things that are happening in the background. Very, extremely exciting. Um, and I'll stop there with that. Um, what I'll also say about preaching to the converted, a very interesting phenomenon for my podcast and my page um, is that um, Many times the government has like these troll armies, right? Um, and, and like if I put out a piece of content that the government perhaps for some reason doesn't approve of or, or the party in government doesn't approve of or not even the official part of the party, but part of the party, like some faction militia doesn't approve, they send you a troll army to kind of uh, uh, dissuade you by virtue of insult. Uh, but what was happening was that some of these people were coming to my page and telling me to fuck myself and to, you know, and, and, and insulting me in, in myriad colorful ways. And, and 
and varieties. And what was happening was they, they were also consuming my content at the same time. Right? So now I have people that used to be in the troll <laughs> army that are now Patreons and they're part of, um, you know, they, used to, they tell me I used to come there, I used to just love it, you know, just like tell you to fuck your father and shit. And, but now I was listening, I'm like, this is quite hilarious. So this used to start with Kashaturi, you know. And it was quite hilarious, so I used to laugh. And then I used to realize, wait, I think they're fucking us. And then by the 10th video, I'm like, fuck, they're really fucking us. Okay, I'm fucking joining this side of the conversation. Um, so while Obviously, yes, I do mainly speak to people that really want to change. Uh, I've met many people, many, like my inbox is rammed with people that uh, have found uh, the podcast as a conduit to that, to that change. Now, as for the tipping point, um, I think the canary in the mine has been dead at least since the 2022 election. And the government knows this. They know it for, the, for a fact. So um, in the 22 election, 2022 election, saw the lowest voter turnout since yeah. 1966. 85%, which is 85% is, uh, let's say if you're Denmark, that's the average. That's normal. Right? If you're the UK, that's pretty bloody good. If you're the UK, it's pretty, pretty good. But if you're Malta, mm. 85% has never happened. Yeah. Right? And I'm... Um, Sure, that we have another election today, that 85% is going to go down to 80, 75, somewhere there. In fact, did they, when, when the uh, results came out, when they, when they were announced, some of the most uh, abrasive figures in party propaganda, like Carl Sonia Alvaro, the first thing they did, they went on social media and they apologized for anything insulting that they might have said, that anything that might have hurt people's hearts and things like that. They saw the writing on the wall. They realized what's going on, like we realized what's going on. Again, five, ten years ago, my podcast would not have been possible, wouldn't have been viable. People wouldn't have understood that much of the picture. For I would have been some marginalized, lone voice in the wilderness talking to a couple of plants and psychopaths like myself, no, psychopaths, psychos like myself. Um, but now this, is, now this is different. Now this is different. And... I think it's also exemplified by um, politicians that belonged to the traditional parties that either have told me in confidence just how much they either feel trapped when, inside that party because it's just part of their identity and now what do I do? Well, now what do I do, man? I, I've been going to that same party and, and, and been part of that institution my, my whole life. I'm going to turn around and not be part like then. Like, like you're going to eviscerate part of my identity, but I know it's not good for me. Yeah. And you have people um, that have to con, um, to con the government, like, like for example, Conrad Borschmanche, with, uh, with his taking on of the lands authority. Um, he's uh, Exira mayor, labor, um, true and true a socialist, true and true loves the labor party, but... There was the lands authority that was misbehaving. There was behaving, for sure, not like a socialist, <laughs> like 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 a, 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 an institution run by a socialist party. And he decided to to take them on, take them to the law courts uh, repeatedly, and eventually won back. I don't know if you're familiar with the story, but basically yeah, the lands yeah, yeah. wanted to relocate a petrol station instead of oh fucking yeah, that garden. was a big win. Yeah, and 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 he won. You know. Um, so there are all these little things happening. I think, I think the, again, the internet, thank you technology, has um, democratized the way we share information. So, uh, you know, when I was growing up, where do you get your news? Your daily news. You get it from uh, one, mm -hmm. net, or TVM. TVM is, when I was growing up, it was mainly run by the nationalists, so it's going to have a nationalist bent. And, and now it has a, a, a PL bent, a, a Labour Party bent. So that was, um, that was where you got your news from. Nowadays, you get from your news from the, the, the Times Online, Love in Malta, The Shift, Malta Daily, maybe John Malia will, will, will say something. And you can make your own assessment now, right? Now you can, like, we're all, we all get a voice in this. And... And I can also give you my opinion of why I think certain situations happen. And I can sit down with, uh, with let's say, Conrad Borchmanche, and he can detail for three hours, four hours, 
his experience of taking on uh, the land's authority in the law courts. You think uh, not the, the, the PBS would have ever allowed that? You think PBS would have ever allowed Conrad Borch Manche to sit down for, for four hours and tell them just what shit these people are being against the people? No, but the internet allows you to do that. So obviously, we're now realizing that the emperor is naked and everyone's like, I think the guy needs to cover up because it's quite small. I thoroughly love your optimism and I love your articulation of why and how this is going to happen. Do we have a when? Do we have a when for the tipping point? I think uh, MEP elections is going to be a shocker. Huh? Enough said. I'm coming to my last question, John. We have gone full circle and we're coming back to you. Mm -hmm. We've talked about you, your life, how you got where you are, the challenges of men, the future of men, of human race, of Malta. What, is, what are the challenges of John Malia? What's the future of John Malia? Are we going to see you as Prime Minister? Can we please see you as Prime Minister? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'd well, love to see you at G, G whatever, at <laughs> Chogham or something. Um, so while that does... So, no, so, so I have a very competitive nature, so obviously there is a part of me that is excited by that idea, but I don't think I'm a, I, I would make uh, an ideal politician. I think, I, I think I'm far more useful um, understanding the grander social narrative um, and, 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 and historically where the country is and uh, persuading persuading decision makers, you know, through my media to kind of push the conversations in, in, in different in different directions. So so my let's say con political social contribution will for now certainly remain within the sphere of media. That's not to say that I'm not going to try and have, you know, maximum influence in, 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 in people really pursuing critical thought above partisan blindness, right? So I, I really would want to um, be a part of that change that is that is happening. It's ongoing. I mean, the, the variety of people I meet, last time I was on the go with social channel. So my demographic generally is males, let's say, um, you know, 20, 20 to 40, thereabouts. As I was on the go with channel, there was like 10 women from Hamroon that all wanted a picture and that were telling me, you know, which podcast they like and they like it when I use this this word or that word. And it was, it was really a sweet moment. Um, but they're not part of my demographic and somehow they too are listening. So I want to continue to kind of keep doing that, keep being a communicator and keep having my time to uh, soak in and at my own pace make my analysis and therein my prescription for what I think we ought to be thinking about next and how. Um, so I think that is what I will keep doing. I also want to be a writer, man. I want to be, uh, so there's a, you know, I really want to write my good screenplay, which... Uh, you what? My good screenplay, you know, like the screenplay yeah, where I look at yeah. and think, yes. Fucking amazing. I think my skill set is there right now because I've been really practicing. Really, I've been writing a lot, like mad. Um, and I've been developing stories and scripts and at the same time trying to make connections outside of our country in order to, to partner up with, with international producers in order to create something. It's a hard up, uphill struggle, uh, but I, also, I always feel like I'm getting somewhat closer to, to the summit. Uh, and, uh, and to be fair, even if I don't succeed, I'm, I'd still be quite content because I never knew that my skill could become as good as it is nowadays. So I'm content in that. But obviously I wish to sit down with my family and watch, you know, you know and have it pop up on Netflix and click with my son and my daughter and my wife and my mom who's been through so much shit because of me for her to, to, to sit down and, 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 you know, see something that I made um, that, that the world perhaps thinks is of some value. But then again, does the world need to tell you 
you know, but I think I really want it to work out because I love writing. So if I can do that full time um, and provide a good life for my family, I really want to do that, you know. Then I have my two kids. Uh, so my son is 15, daughter is seven, and I've really, I'm really proud of myself in that regard that um, I know what I can give them and I give them a lot of it, right? Uh, I spend, I spend a fair amount of time, I don't spend a lot of time with them. I wish I could spend more uh, and that's going to be part of the plan for 2024. Uh, but the time that I do spend, uh, I'm really paying attention to their needs, what they're thinking about, how they're thinking about it, and why they're thinking about it, and I make them question themselves, you know? And I try to give them as much guidance, and, uh, and I think also this is important for dads, I think. Um, I think if dads can, can think of themselves as the person in the in the family unit that is gives encouragement like fills your kids hearts with courage and if they can watch you be courageous and therefore they follow in your footsteps for me anyway that has that has really given me a lot of sense of um a lot of sense of purpose and esteem and it has and it's really paid off in my kids has really paid off in my kids my wife i have a fantastic uh, I know it's not like a platitude, like beautiful wife. She is, she's, she's fucking gorgeous. Um, and, um, and she's my favorite storyteller. And she's my favorite um, comedian. She's a clown, man. She's a real big clown, you know. And it's fantastic. It's fantastic. Um, plus, she really taught me. I think the biggest thing my wife taught me was to think of people as in, in less monochromatic terms, right? I, I used to discard people a lot. Like there was a point where I was like, oh no, but he once said that, so no. Like people are, I still think that people are either a net positive or a net negative. Uh, but there is some level of bullshit I'm willing to kind of deal with with other people. Um, and especially if I can tell you, that was bullshit. Um, and can we kind of like not have that bullshit again? Uh, I, I think and she really taught me that. She really taught me not to just throw people away. Um, and I hope I can continue to be uh, as true to my moralities, uh, morality and values as I have because it's really paid off. Re like my life is so, I, guys, I can't fucking tell you how much better it is to just be um, honest, not tolerate anyone that's, look, don't tolerate anyone that's not honest around you in your life because you can't rely on that person. You walk in, even if they're the most competent people in the world, you walk into a room and there's been some lies that have been exchanged between different parties and you can't even plan for that. Like it's so easy to fall into different kinds of traps and sabotages. So my, um, if I may be as presumptuous as to give some unsolicited advice, I would say to, to get rid of people that are untruthful in your life. Or just like tell them this, my guy, uh, shut the fuck up, like change, change your wicked ways. And, and, but then if they don't change, you gotta, because it's a, it's, a, it's a burden you, you don't want to carry around. I think that's my future, I think. Ah, can I say, can I plug a show I'm going to do? Yeah, of course you can. All right, so uh, we're going to do a, so we've just been working with Go. So one thing that I've always wanted to uh, produce and import from the great uh, British, I'm a huge Anglophile, um, from the great British culture is the art of the Oxford Union debate, right, whereby you have... Uh, a moderator, you have two speakers, and everyone is given their fair amount of time to talk and make opening statements and rebuttals and take uh, questions from the audience. But in a very, um, you know, because the British, they've done, they've done terrible things around the world, but they've also done fantastic things around the world. And one of them is to be kind of um, 
is civilized in their dialogue. I, I really enjoy the way, um, the, you know, the, the British culture of, of debate, and I, that also kind of translates into parliamentary question time, for example, is, is wow. You wow. like that? Wow. I think you I, like that? I do like that, yes. <laughs> I, I think, I, think <coughs> I mean, the, the, the wit and the level of processing that they're doing at the same time yeah. is something that is, well, it, it's a it's a it's a skill that I, I I think is both fun to watch and West Main I think is just fun to watch. I don't, I don't know how useful it is. I don't know how do you feel. There's so much to it that is subliminal. Yes. There's yes. so much that is an unsaid language in English. Uh, that an, if if you tune into it, if you have the ability to tune into that unspoken language, or even that slight language, or even the sarcasm or the 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 kind of juxtaposition of the language when you say, oh, I, I'm a little bit concerned, and what you actually mean is, I'm shitting bricks right now. <laughs> uh, if you can tune into that oh, and you good. can understand it, it yeah. is, and it, as you said, it's incredibly intuitive and, and exciting. Yeah. So what, 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 what I want to bring is um, these debates whereby we will have um, structured debates uh, where we'll be talking about uh, perhaps, like, questions that are that have been perturbing me and I think implicitly also perturbing multi-society like the role of the church for example like we have let's really debate it but um, but let's have you know a theologian there and let's have someone who is uh, perhaps like some politically affiliated with the church somehow and, and two people that are entirely the opposite and um, let's try and build uh, a common ground. Like my goal at the end of it is to try to really understand and distill everyone's arguments to understand. Okay, this is where we all are right now, and here is like if we had this was a giant Venn diagram. This is where we all overlap, and that place where we overlap, there's the bridge to the next step, guys. That's where that's that's what I want to kind of uh, hopefully succeed, but I will definitely try to do with these debates. I'm really happy about it because I've been trying to kind of set this deal up with Go for about a year. Um, and I've been wanting to do these kinds of debates for many years. Uh, and now uh, I get to yet again create more dialogical content, which I'm which I'm really, I'm super excited about it. You know, it's great to be excited about your work. I'm really excited for you. Because to conclude, as that is the last thing that you've come to and the last thing that you've said, that ties in so many elements that we've discussed over the last couple of hours. And you're saying, this is where I'm going to the future. And you're, you've integrated so many. And the, even the questions I've asked you about society, about Malta, about men, about you, they all come together with a future vision. Thank you. John, you. it has been fantastic. I'm really glad we got round to doing this. Yes, you know what? I that was super uh, enjoyable, insightful. You made you made me join dots that I I never had the time to. Um, you took you took the conversation into uh, particular avenues, especially and in, in certain sequences that gave me a new perspective. So anyway, thank you. Thank you.